everyone. Uh, watching, uh, you know, turning on Zoom and watching people come in, it's a little bit like watching a rocket launch, except a little bit more exciting. Uh, my name is Anna Stanschus. I'm director of Anne Tannenbaum Center for Jewish Studies and Alan Malka Green Professor of Yiddish Studies at the University of Toronto. And I am super excited to uh, welcome you to our first ever virtual book launch of uh, Professor Louis Kaufman's new book. Uh, today's event is a Tannenbaum family lecture, and I would like to extend our deepest gratitude to the Tannenbaum family for making this event possible and generously supporting the center. Uh, I'm very excited that our first virtual book launch is, ha, has been written by Professor Louis Kaplan. It's called At Wit's End, The Deadly Discourse on the Jewish Joke from Weimar, Germany to the Holocaust and Beyond. Um, um, I hope you can still see me. Uh, Louis Kaplan is, doesn't need a lengthy introduction uh, had I been introducing him here at the, uh, you know, in person at the Center for Jewish Studies, but for those of you who have not yet uh, met Professor Kaplan or are not in Toronto, let me just say that he holds a position of professor in uh, uh, visual arts and uh, uh, of Professor of Visual Studies and Art History here at the University of Toronto, and is an affiliated member of the Anne Tannenbaum Center for Jewish Studies. Uh, I have been privileged to work with Lewis on a number of occasions, including a crazy initiative. I shouldn't say crazy at the book launch, Lewis, should I? Um, uh, you know, but I do think it was uh, a little innovative. Uh, so anyway, initiative that uh, he, Andrea Most from English and I have done back in 2005 called Rejuvenation, where we came together to think about new Jewish culture coming our way in the 21st century. And so many of those ideas that we aired out then, such as people caring more about the environment in the context of Judaism, rethinking Jewish ritual uh, to include more women or new Yiddish culture, are still interesting to talk about. And the none of us, I think, when we were so excited to talk about future in the 21st century, <laughs> but I don't think none of us could really have imagined is such a thing as a, a book launch in quarantine or quarantine to start with. But I have to say that although it is quarantine, Lewis's book gave us a chance to come together in this truly global fashion and discuss one thing that seems to be forever relevant to any culture, no matter what circumstances we live, and that is its humor. So now let me give you a little bit more formal introduction to Professor Kaplan, who um, is a professor of history and theory of photography and new media uh, at the Graduate Department of Art History here at the University of Toronto and the Department of Visual Studies of University of Toronto Mississauga campus, uh, where he served as a founding chair. He, um, he holds a degree, uh, degrees from Harvard University and from uh, University of Chicago. He is the author of numerous books in the field of art history and photography studies, including Photography and Humor, which was published by Reaction Books uh, in London in 2017, American Exposures, Photography and Community in the 20th Century, uh, and Laszlo Maholi Nagy, Biographical Writings that came out of Duke uh, University Press in 1995. He has published over 80 essays and articles, including a number of Jewish topics. I hope you'll forgive me for not uh, naming every single one of them so that we have a little bit of time left to discuss Lewis's new book, um, which he began uh, uh, writing as a postdoctoral fellow at the Franz Rosenzweig Center for German Jewish Cultural History and Literature at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem from 1993 to 1995. Then he put it aside uh, and then uh, finished it uh, in the past few years. And now, it is out from Fordham, uh, just uh, hot off the press. And uh, as if you stay uh, 
Oh, if you look at your screen, you will see that if you want to buy it right now, I feel like I'm on the shopping channel, uh, you can get a discount of 20% um, off. And I strongly recommend that you do. I have uh, I've been reading this book for the past few days and honestly, I can't put it down. The level of uh, uh, insight and theoretical sophistication and just how easy it is to read uh, is uh, something unparalleled. So um, uh, congrats Congratulations, uh, Lewis, on that. Um, a lot of, it's not just me who liked the book. Uh, uh, a colleague from uh, University of Columbia, Jeremy Dauber, has uh, written the following uh, words. I'm going to read them out loud. With insight and incisiveness, a steady hand and a clear eye, Kaplan navigates for the most treacherous of comic, uh, comedic waters. The role of the Jewish joke in Germany for much of the 20th century and beyond. Jokes have sharp and manifold edges and Kaplan is a clear and brilliant guide to explaining how they bite as well as bind. Um, there are many more uh, quotes about this book and uh, um, I will not uh, take it away with my kind of rendition of this, but instead would invite for Lewis uh, to uh, make some remarks uh, and, uh, and uh, talk a little bit about, uh, well, the book and, uh, and welcome you all uh, here. And then we will continue with our program that will include our uh, guests who agreed to come and to discuss uh, uh, Lewis's book, Professor Stephen Ashheim from, from Hebrew University, and Professor Jenny Kaplan uh, from uh, uh, Towson University. I will introduce them uh, as uh, they when they speak for the first time. So the format of the event will be as following: first, Professor Kaplan will say a few words, then. I will introduce uh, professor, another Professor Kaplan, Jen, Jenny Kaplan, uh, and then uh, we will start the discussion, which will be with uh, Professor Ashheim given the first uh, question. We'll talk a little bit, they, they will talk a little bit among themselves, and then uh, they'll take, Lewis will take questions from the audience. However, if you have questions uh, right now and you want to put them, uh, and you want to ask them, please put them in Q&A. Uh, and uh, we, I will see them, and as soon as the moment arrives, uh, you will either be asked to uh, ask this question with your mic on, or I will read this question for you. Okay, so without any more introductions, I tried to do them in four minutes, it took me six, but, um, you know, too much to say, too much excitement, uh, and uh, Louis, please take it away. Thanks so much, Anna, for that wonderful introduction and for recounting some of my life writing that has led to this very special occasion. I wanna thank you and the Ann Tannenbaum Center for Jewish Studies for sponsoring this event and for all the support that the center has shown for the book, not only by means of a subvention to help with its publication, but also by honoring At Wit's End with its selection as the Rosh Hashanah gift for the major donors. And I do hope that some of these readers are in the audience today. I want to express my gratitude to the excellent team at Fordham University Press and to raise a special shout out to my incredible editor, Richard Morrison, who grasped this book's significance immediately. This is the third time that I've published a book with him and I hope that it won't be the last. Now, it's a really funny thing to have a book about the discourse on Jewish wit in 20th century Germany, published with the imprint of a Jesuit and Catholic university in New York. But it seems to have worked out pretty well. As many of you know, I have published quite a number of books in my life, both academic and trade, but that this one is by far the most meaningful to me. It truly has been a labor of love. This has a lot to do with my passion for this subject, but also because of the sense of accomplishment that one derives from publishing a book 27 years after the time of its initial, initial conception. I went off and became this photo historian and had to put this project aside, but I'm so happy that I've been able to get back to it and to publish it now. However, at the same time, I wanna say to all of the Jewish studies graduate students 
who are joining us today, if you ever have the good fortune to receive a postdoctoral fellowship, please do not follow my example and wait this long until you get the work out there. Gray, bald, a long time. Now, as Anna's related, I began this project as a postdoctoral fellow at the Franz Rosenzweig Center at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And this is another important institution to which I am extremely grateful and that I want to thank here for its initial support. Those were two amazing years of fellowship. And this was also the place where I met one of our guest speakers. I want to publicly acknowledge Stephen Ashheim as an invaluable mentor and friend who has championed the Witzbuch from those first days and who encouraged me never to give up on it. It is such a, an honor and a pleasure to have him here to celebrate the book at its launch, signing in and staying up late from Jerusalem. Thanks also to my new collaborator colleague, Jennifer Kaplan, with a C, for participating in this event from Maryland. She represents a new generation of scholars who are taking Jewish humor seriously. I appreciate the love and support of my family, my partner, Melissa, for her courage and her encouragement, and our son, Sasha, for his own gags, jokes, and pratfalls. I also want to acknowledge my father, Leon, to whom this book is dedicated, even though he's complaining to me that the print is too small for him to read. I thank him for all his words of wit and wisdom. He's been such a role model for my brother Arnie and myself. Our dad is now in his 100th year of living, loving, and laughing. And he is zooming in today from the Jewish home in Freehold, New Jersey. Hi, Dad. Glad you could make it. Many people have said to me that in this time of plague, we certainly need laughter more, now more than ever. The relationship of laughter and suffering, of laughter that comes out of suffering, is certainly one of the most important ways through which we have understood the cultural role and the historical function of Jewish wit, and why we turn to it as a coping mechanism and as a means of comic relief, especially in troubled times. This was certainly the case for a number of the studies that constitute this book, as I review how De Yudische Witz, meaning both the Jewish joke and Jewish wit, became a rhetorical figure and a discursive flashpoint in the larger political and cultural debates in Germany and in the German-speaking lands against the backdrop of anti-Semitism and the Jewish question from the Weimar Republic through the rise of the Nazi regime to the Holocaust and its aftermath, the reparation period called Wiedergutmachung, which literally means making good again. It is a fascinating and complex narrative, and I'm sure that we will take up many of its main characters in our discussion period. It is a discourse, always lively and sometimes deadly, that offers up many ideological and disciplinary perspectives with authors arguing about and vying for the meaning and the significance of the Jewish joke in Germany in this crisis-laden period. But perhaps I am getting ahead of myself and I should leave the book's further summary to Jennifer. So let me conclude these opening remarks by confessing to you that I have never been any good at telling Jewish jokes. And I am not planning to play stand up or even sit down comic today. But I have always been fascinated by what Jewish jokes can tell us and what they can teach us in their intertwining of wit and wisdom. And I would argue, in line with the epigraph to the book's introduction, that this experience can be profound. 
as Heinrich Bermann said in 1908, quote, deep, deep like so many Jewish anecdotes. They offer insight into the tragic comedy of contemporary Judaism. And that quote from 1908 rings through the whole period of my study and certainly even until today. But on the flip side, I am also attuned to what they cannot tell us and how they often resist reflection, especially when they take us to the point where the rest is not silence, but rather a resounding laughter. And I believe that this is also what compelled me to write at wit's end. Thank you. Thank you, Louis. And uh, I have to say that there is a question already in the comments saying that it's been 13 minutes and they have, they, there has not been a single joke. So yeah, so our speakers better step up to that uh, uh, comment by more title. And there is also Mazel Tov from our colleague, Laura Levitt from Temple. Laura, thank you for coming and uh, uh, thank you for the Mazel Tov on behalf of Louis. Um, so yeah, very exciting to see, have you here. So. Um, uh, Jenny, I would like to introduce Professor Kaplan with a C, uh, uh, you know, who, I, who I personally just met, uh, I want to say like a year ago, but Jenny, but it was actually a lot less than a year ago at the conference that uh, she and the, her colleague Jared Tani organized in the University of North Carolina and Wilmington. And uh, this was the last conference for, I think, uh, Lewis and for me and for maybe for Jenny that we attended in person. So mm -hmm. yeah, I hope Jewish humor, it was also on Jewish humor, but I hope humor, humor does not end <laughs> with that conference, right? Like the books will keep it going. Uh, so Professor Kaplan is Assistant Professor of Religious Studies and Program Director of Jewish Studies at Tosin University. Her research is primarily in the field of American Judaism and popular culture, and she also works on race and gender. She has published uh, uh, and presented on topics ranging from comic books and graphic novels to Jews and zombies uh, to the pedagogy of Jewish studies, and her forthcoming monograph on Judaism and humor in the United States is being published uh, with Wayne State University Press. So, uh, Professor Kaplan, the floor is yours, the virtual microphone. Thank you, Anna. Um, yeah, it feels like that conference was a million years ago, and in fact, it was only seven months. Uh, we've started calling that conference the Conference of the End of the World, in fact. Um, so thank you for that introduction. Thank you to Lewis for inviting me to be a part of this event. Thank you to the Tannenbaum Center. Um, it's just really exciting to be part of the launch for a book that I feel really strongly about, uh, and that I think is going to make a lot of really important um, interventions into the study of Jewish humor. Um, I think I told Lewis this uh, a while back, but I was actually asked to review this book by four different publications within about a week and a half of each other. Uh, so the first one obviously got the yes, um, so there will be a review of the book in the Journal of Jewish Identities um, coming out by me, but it was one of one of the things that was so remarkable to me was that these requests for reviews were not only coming from the sort of usual suspects, so places like the Journal of Jewish Identities, but also a journal of Eastern European studies, not Jewish studies, not popular culture, but just Journal of Eastern European studies, um, which is not some place that I would normally expect to be asked to, uh, to work. So um, it, it really says a lot about the range of the book and, and the reach of the book. Um, in, in answer to the question of in the chat, uh, normally I would start my remarks on any of these topics with a joke, but in fact, I'm not starting with a joke this time um, because Lewis's book is not fundamentally a recreation of other existing books that collect Jewish jokes, that analyze Jewish jokes. His book is about the discourse around Jewish jokes, um, and so instead of starting with a joke, I'll start with a anecdote about the discourse around Jewish jokes. Um, and that's a story that comes from the Hasidic Rebbe Nachman of Braslav. And Nachman wrote in one of his stories that one can understand the nature of a land by knowing its humor, 
In order to understand something, one must know the jokes related to it. So this idea that the truest nature of a place or possibly a people is revealed through jokes kind of presages what Lewis Kaplan is arguing in At Wit's End. Um, Lewis proves that not only are there still new things to be written about Jewish humor, but also that Jewish humor as a topic defies any sort of easy classification in terms of fitting into one field, one discipline. It's not just something that's of interest to religious studies. It's not just something that's of interest to any, any particular subfield. It really is a very broad topic. Uh, additionally, one of the really important things that I think uh, Lewis does with this book is to remind us that there are really vital conversations to be had about Jewish humor that do not or should not at least involve the humor of the United States. Um, and as Anna already mentioned, uh, she and Lewis and I were all at this conference at the end of February and the beginning of March that was on global Jewish humor. And we're all working on a, a volume together about global Jewish humor. And I think it's really important that we start to desituate the 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 core locus of Jewish humor away from the U.S. There's been this sort of narrative that Jewish humor somehow starts with Sholem Aleichem, comes to the United States, gets invented in the way that we know it in the U.S., and then every place else that does it now, Israel, whatever, it's all like the U.S. or not like the U.S. And what Kaplan does in this book, Lewis Kaplan, I should say, does in this book is refocus us on the fact that there's a whole lineage of humor by Jews and about Jews that far predates that Sholem Aleichem origin moment. Um, he, he makes reference in the book to Judas Asher's 1810 collection of Jewish jokes and L.M. Buschenkahl's uh, 1812 collection, which borrowed from Asher's. And that's a full 70 years before Sholem Aleichem started publishing. Um, so I think Kaplan does a really important thing here in, in moving our focus back and moving it off of this narrative of Jewish humor just having this very linear progression. Um, the book also helps us to develop a really capacious understanding of what makes humor Jewish. It brings up questions of whether it needs to be about Jews or by Jews or, Fro or both. Freud sort of argued that it needs to be both. Um, you know, Freud argued that you have to have equal investment on both sides of a joke so Jews can tell what he calls tendentious jokes to each other and anti-Semites can tell tendentious jokes to each other but an anti-Semite can't tell a tendentious joke to a Jew and it won't work. Um, at the same time, though, Omri Bergson speculated that laughter, that, that emotion is the enemy of laughter, and that you, in fact, can't laugh at something if you feel too strongly about it. So Lewis is really tapping us into this question of the motivations behind a joke and the emotional resonances of a joke, um, to, to quote Lewis from his own book. He argues that the, the, the study that he has here demonstrates how giving thought and earnest reflection to the meaning of the Jewish joke, as well as to its provocative laughter, provides an unusual and unique perspective by which one can gain insights into this deadly serious historical moment occupied with the Jewish question. So you mentioned Jeremy Dauber um, on it, and I think it's really important to note that this book is not the German microcosm to something like Dauber's recent study of Jewish comedy. Um, this book is its own kind of attempt to look at the, the ripples and the impact of Jewish humor. So it isn't, it isn't taking these larger totalizing looks at Jewish humor and just zooming in on one part of it. It's a whole different way of approaching the question. Um, and one of the things I think that Lewis does that's so important is he argues that the collapse, quote, I'm quoting now, the collapse of a clear-cut distinction between Jewish self-irony and anti-Semitism troubles the work of any analyst who hopes to interpret these jokes in a straightforward or non-ambivalent way. 
the narrative around Jewish jokes all too often can fall into victim blaming. And you get into this idea that what he calls Jewish self-irony or other people might call self-deprecating humor or even self-loathing Jewish humor, if we want to get into the way that Philip Roth and some folks like him have been labeled. And the idea that that sort of humor is, quote, bad for the Jews and that it leads to anti-Semitism and therefore should be off limits. And Kaplan does a beautiful job in this book of uncoupling those two things from each other, uh, particularly in chapter three of the book, uh, where he talks about Alex um, Moskovsky and Moskovsky's very clear defense of Jewish satirists and, and Jewish comedians' right to be self-ironic or self-deprecating. Um, it's a very important move that the book does to, to break this idea that Jewish comedians and satirists are in any way responsible for the anti-Semitism that may arise out of certain narratives, um, that, that we, we should not blame them for what other people do with these ideas or these images or this humor. Um, the other thing, uh, because I know you didn't, I don't want to say too much because uh, there's more conversation to be had, but the other really important thing I want to stress is that part of what Lewis brings to this conversation is his point of view as a scholar of art and visual culture. Um, and he just mentioned in his introduction that he put this book aside for years in order to be a, a scholar of photography, but I think that the book is so much stronger for him having had those decades of experience looking at the world of visual art. Um, most studies of Jewish humor focus on what I'm going to call literary, which is not just um, written, but I, I'm including movies and television because they work from a script. Um, so it's, it's written Jewish humor or it's about certain accents or delivery, but the second chapter of this book focuses on visual art. Um, and that is such an important contribution to this conversation. That chapter focuses on editorial cartoons and caricatures and just the ability to shift our focus away from the written word or the spoken word and onto an analysis of images and the way that, I mean, if a picture is worth a thousand words, then we should be thinking more about pictures, um, but we don't. And, and that's, one of the, that's one of the biggest things I think that Lewis is bringing to this conversation and will continue to bring to this conversation that, um, that studies of Jewish humor need. Um, so I don't want to I don't want to take up any more time, um, and I don't want to have any more spoilers about the the content of the book. But I look forward to hearing more and and talking more during the conversation. Uh, thank you so much uh, for these remarks, and I have to say I do agree with the visual aspects of it. In fact, you know, like going for pages of the book and seeing those caricatures and images. Uh, themselves. Uh, I mean, Lewis's analysis, but also what we think uh, uh, is funny or not funny, what we understand, what we don't understand, that makes it really rich experience uh, when we read um, uh, this uh, book. And uh, Jenny, I already have some questions and Q&A uh, coming up, and that's about the nature of uh, uh, Israeli audiences versus English and Yiddish humor, but I think you can click and look at that question yourself. We will open to Q&A a little bit later, and I also want to encourage uh, people to put those questions in. The earlier the question comes in, the bigger chance is that it will get answered because we're an audience of 180 people, so put those questions in, especially if you are uh, in the CGS 1000-2000 uh, seminar. So um, now I would like to uh, start our discussion and uh, uh, invite um, uh, Professor Stephen Ashheim from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem uh, to say a few words. But before I, uh, I, I do that, I would like to formally introduce him. Uh, he uh, is a Professor Emeritus at Hebrew U, where he taught cultural and intellectual history at the history department since 1982. He has also acted, as we heard from Lewis, as the director of the Franz Rosenzweig Research Center for German Literature and Cultural History. He is an author of 
numerous books on the topic of history and culture of Jews in Germany. And Professor Ashram, forgive me for not giving all the titles because I actually want people to uh, hear from you. But I do want to read one of the quotes uh, uh, of yours, uh, uh, specifically what you said about Lewis's book. Uh, where you say, it's a marvelous book, profoundly probes the deadly seriousness and deep structures of the discourse around the Jewish joke, as uttered by various European uh, uh, progenitors, propagandists, and analysts, especially in Germany from Weimar Republic, through Nazism, and the post-Holocaust period. This is not your usual run-of-the-mill book on Jewish jokes. And I have to say, I agree with that. And also what we just heard from Jenny Kaplan really confirms that too. So uh, my question to you, uh, Professor Hashem, is uh, tell us uh, how the story started. How did you get involved with Lewis Kaplan and, uh, uh, and this project? And also give us some insights on how it started and maybe some things that Lewis is not telling us. Yeah, you know, maybe. Um, well, I'm not sure I can do that, but um, I, will, I will start by saying something very personal and which Lewis should take seriously, but not too seriously. And that is, um, this is a book that I am sorry I did not write. However, the problem is that I know that I'm not capable of writing it. And this isn't only because I don't have the necessary Zitzfleisch. I assume everyone knows what Zitzfleisch is, because one thing I noticed, Lewis, even though you talk about the importance of the body when it comes to Jewish humor, there are very, very few buttocks jokes there. But you do have other wonderful jokes when you speak not of Wissenschaft, but of Wissenschaft. Um, but I could not have written it because, and it's very difficult in a Zoom session to, to get to it. So I am suggesting, even though I'm only getting a very small commission, that you actually buy and read the book because it really does have <clears throat> both imaginative and conceptual brilliance. There is a density of references here and deeply subtle insights. Uh, somebody said it's easy to read. That's not true. Aww. Parts of it are easy to read. Other parts, I've been reading it now for two days and parts of it you have to study if you are to get to the depths. So a lot of it is reasonable and easy. Some of it is complex, as a complex subject should be. Um, I'm going to, I'll speak in a minute. Um, yeah, all right, about the history of the book. Um, first of all, I was director of the Franz Rosenzweig Institute, but not when Lewis was there. Lewis was there in antediluvian times, in Jurassic times. 1993 to 1995. Um, so one thing that struck me, even though we've talked about the book over the many years, one thing that struck me, or two things, that some of the earliest insights that Lewis had are still there and are still validly there. I remember our discussions about this crazy man, Arthur Trebich, one of the first chapters in the book, which existed many, many years ago. Um, there is also the chapter on uh, Lantman and the Jewish joke reparations. All this was there in his mind many, many years ago. So I was expecting to see simply a rehash. What is most impressive about the book is first of all, and I'm not, a, I'm not in the field of Jewish jokes, it is completely updated. It is contemporary with all the relevant literature, which is most interesting. And even though Jennifer Kaplan with a C didn't want to go into America, what I found terrific was the very end in which not, you see Lewis, I actually read the whole book. Uh, at the very end, you have these discussions in which, and we're reaching November the 3rd very soon, Trump's America, 
and Jewish humor appears, in which you have none other than Larry David there, Harvey Weinstein, Borat, and even today's neo-Nazis. So, um, you ask, how did it all begin? Uh, and that's the question. I was always talking with Lewis, and so the first question I want to put to Lewis now is, how did you actually get to the subject? Um, what, what, what was the prompting? Uh, and reason, and the truth is I'm not up to date in all the contemporary serious literature, but I, when I heard that you're doing a, 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 a study on Jewish humor, I thought, oy vey, another one of these folksy, schmaltzy studies, the Jew says this, the Jew says that, it's not at all like that. It is a deadly serious issue. Although, and I'll make this last remark, and then you're going to have to answer, why on earth you started this and what prompted it? Because I don't know the answer. The book is called At Wit's End. But that's a misnomer. Because Lewis points out all the time that in the end, the joke is on the people who think that they are controlling it. There is always a step beyond in which the joke kind of comes back at you and really bites you. Um, perhaps the best example I can give, uh, and there are many, is right, right at the end. Uh, he's talking about the neo-Nazis now, who insist that when they use Nazi or anti-Semitic language, it's only ironic. They don't really mean it. And of course, irony is the classic Jewish uh, capacity. And he ends here. The neo-Nazi not only loves to make fun of others, but also does not shy away from ironizing his own personality at every opportunity. I hope, Lewis, you're not saying that the neo-Nazis are the new Jews. The floor is yours. Wow. Thank you, Steve. Uh, let, let's rewind the tape uh, to go back to the early 90s. So, yeah, people ask, you know, how did you get on this subject? Well, uh, some of you know that uh, I was uh, based in Berlin in the early 90s, and I was doing uh, freelance uh, work and uh, revising my dissertation uh, into a book. And um, at that time, I was already interested in that concept, or I kind of, you know, coined this construct of Wissenschaft, this neologism that mashes, mashes up jokes and wit on the one hand with knowledge and science on the other. And it's funny, Steve, that, that I'm telling this now to you because I actually drew that idea from Nietzsche in so certain respects of the idea of Frohliche Wissenschaft, right? And you, of course, uh, an expert in the legacy of Nietzsche. Um, that's really one of the sources, you know, that I was drawing from. And I had a postdoc uh, in Germany uh, at a, a place called the Verbund für Wissenschaftsgeschichte, right, which is history of science. And um, I published a book where, you know, on this guy, Charles Fort, where I was already exploring, uh, the book is called in German, Wissenschaftliche Weltbetrachtungen, right, which I guess, I don't know, we translate it as humorous scientific world speculations or something like that, right? So I was already interested, you know, in that, in that double-edged sword construct. And then I guess I was thinking about how it might be applicable to the study of Jewish wits and uh, how, you know, I would be able to sort of think through um, how, on the one hand, how wits became uh, a proper subject of humanistic inquiry. And of course that brings in Freud, right? And I think we see the traces even of that in the introduction because I talk about this idea of uh, uh, Jewish joke science, right? And, and, and that we really go back to Freud and we can talk more about Freud later. Um, and then while I was you know, thinking through these questions, our, our old mutual friend, Martin Bauer, told me about the, the Rosenzweig Fellowship Program. And I wondered if there would be an interest there in cultural work that explored Yudishevitz, 
not only in relationship to Wissenschaft and, and this you know, founding of it as a, as, a, as a subject for scientific inquiry, but also, and this is the most important part, in terms of its relationship to the Judenfrage, in terms of its relationship to the Jewish question. And so, I don't know if you, I know Paul is out there too, shout out to Paul. I don't know if you guys remember, but I put together an application under the title, The Joke and the Question. That was, that was, that was the original title of this project, The Joke and the Question. And with all the, you know, valences of, of, of those, putting those two things together. And it was accepted, obviously, and, and I was off and running. So that's really the, you know, the origin story of, uh, of, of the project all the way back in the early 90s. Now, where do you want me to go from there? All right. I've got one or two questions and then we should really open it up. All right. Um, uh, basically, we, you know, I, I think maybe one should say something about uh, what a fundamental theme that runs through uh, the book, which is that, fund well, number one, um, jokes are always about questioning and the questionable. Right. That's one. Two, that there seems to be a really dialectical link between uh, Jewish jokes told by Jews and the anti-Semitic take on them. And what you do all the time is you weave between these things and you don't see them as antitheses, rather as internally uh, self-contradicting at times. That, that's just one, one uh, element that I think we, we should uh, mention. Um, there are other things too. For instance, I, I'd love you to expand on just one, you know, that's what I said, Lewis has these sudden, subtle, subtle insights, maybe from him or from somebody else. Wit assumes a common superiority. What does that mean? And, and what is that telling us? So I, I think you should say a little more about the connecting thread between Jewish, inner Jewish jokes and anti-Semitic uh, deployments. All the time we're talking about ironies, mobility, and so on. But let me just ask the last two questions and then you can fire away. Um, you, you mentioned Mary Douglas who says, interestingly, that jokes are always revelatory of contradictions within the social order. Mm -hmm. And that's where, that's where jokes start becoming existentially, socially, culturally, politically, very uh, important. But you also are all the time dealing with the question of irony, Jewish irony. And so my question is this, is Jewish irony unique? Do other minorities use irony? And the next question, of course, is can majorities be ironic or is it simply a property of a minority? And I will stop there. Oh boy. That's fielding a lot of questions. Can, can I cherry pick? <laughs> cherry pick as you will. Well, I wanted to get back to this uh, point that I was struck when you talked about my mention of wit as needing a kind of sharing of common superiority. That was actually not my quote. That was something that Eric Collar says uh, when he talks about his view of, of the space of binding together, like, like Jeremy Dauber, Dauber also mentions, the space of binding together that you need in order for a joke to be successful. So what I'm interested really there is that, you know, I guess I should step back and talk a little bit about Collar. So Collar is writing this book about Israel among the nations, um, right at the cusp uh, on the eve of the, the Nazi uh, uh, takeover of power. Uh, so like 1932, 1933, the, in, the, just in January, the book actually gets recalled and the, you know, they, they destroy the, the, the printer's blocks and what have you. And then he eventually gets to publish it three years later in, in Switzerland in 1936. But he is really interesting because he kind of looks at the Jewish joke as symptomatic of Jewish-German intercultural relations. And his point is 
that, like when you talk about social order, for him, it's this idea that the joke is a symptom of what's going on in that society and whether or not Jews and Germans are getting along. So his point is that if there comes a time where a common, you know, superiority, his point is, is he doesn't mean, uh, it's not exactly what you, what you think in terms of superiority and inferiority. His point is, if there can't be this common sharing of, 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 of laughing at something, right, together, then you know that a society is in trouble and that there's a chance that there's going to be uh, intercultural breakdown and things are going to get even worse. And so I think that's really interesting that for Kahler and also for Edward Fuchs, right? Because um, Jenny talked about cha the chapter two on, on caricature. Um, we shouldn't forget one of the main uh, players in my book is this uh, amazing uh, visual cultural historian, I think we would call him now, even though he didn't call himself that, Edward Fuchs who was you know, a socialist and a Marxist, uh, very strong in his views and his beliefs. And he also is somebody who believed that jokes in general, not just Jewish jokes, are always barometers of, of social conditions and, and what's going on. And, and, and for him, you know, um, when there's going to be times of, of let's say, uh, a reaction uh, in, in a society, uh, uh, if, if there is going to be oppression, what, whatever, those are going to somehow uh, express themselves in this kind of release valve that humor provides, right? So um, that I think uh, fits in with, with your idea of somehow, uh, you talked a little bit about dialectics and you talked a little bit about how somehow jokes are, uh, are, are, are somehow feeding on the, the, the contradictions, uh, both responding to and also maybe provoking uh, contradictions in the social order um, at, at different times. And I think we see from our book that sometimes uh, things are more stable and, uh, uh, and where uh, there's a lot more toleration and uh, there's a lot more uh, openness for jokes and, uh, uh, being the, the kind of like, you know, working between these porous borders of Jews and Germans, and that other times uh, things become uh, very xenophobic or become uh, very reactionary and where anti-Semitic uh, 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 hateful tendencies are on the rise. And at those times, uh, you know, that's really scary times. And of course, you know, I think one of, like you said, that you mentioned the, the Trump aspect of the book. Well, I guess one of the reasons why this book now is sort of, uh, you know, entering into popular imagination and it's really, you know, people are interested in it is because we find ourselves, unfortunately, not just because, not just because of COVID, but we find ourselves um, at a time where there is a lot of uh, reactionary uh, uh, anti-Semitic uh, memes and uh, uh, violence. Uh, and at that time, uh, these kinds of questions about uh, the Jewish joke uh, and its relationship to anti-Semitism uh, become very pressing and uh, very, uh, you know, of the moment. Right. Um... I have another question, and then I think we should really open it up. Don't want to take up too much time. Sander Gilman makes an interesting point, which you mention in the book, that Jews could only really begin to use wit and humor and laugh at themselves only at the point that they became or wanted to be emancipated and yeah. entered into society. Could yeah. you comment on that? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And it also um, ties into one of Jenny's points, because Jenny was saying, you know, that my study shows the roots of Jewish joke books in Germany going back to 1810 and 1812 with uh, Rabbi Bushenthal, uh, etc. Uh, uh, and exactly that is the moment that uh, Gilman is also talking about. The moment that when you get out of the ghetto, um, when you have this time of post-emancipation, uh, for the Jews, uh, when they enter into these kinds of intercultural spaces, um, that is the time when the Jewish joke lore uh, takes off. And it has to do with this question of, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's attention, right? It's, it's on the one hand, uh, trying to assimilate, but on the other hand, being aware of one's uh, ethnic difference. I mean, 
you, you see that also, of course, in Jewish American humor as well. I mean, that's, you know, which, which Jenny is an expert, right? I mean, that's one of the linchpins in terms of how the dialectic works, right? So it's no wonder then that this is happening, you know, or starting um, in, in the 1810s at that time. And then it moves on to study that I didn't do. I mean, I, the work was done for me already. I mean, we all know the book by the scholar Jefferson Chase, right? Who looked at the so-called, uh, and Gilman also uses this term, the so-called Jewish Joker journalists, the three J's of, uh, of, of Heine uh, and, uh, and Safir uh, and uh, Borna, right? And though there is also in the, you know, that, a little bit further in that era, but it's all really about this same uh, uh, perspective of the satirical Jewish force, which of course is dangerous because a lot of times it's seen as disrespectful, corrosive to the national character of Germany. And all these things, you know, start, I mean, it's not, a, it's my, my, I only take up the story in the 20th century, starting maybe with Freud in the late 1890s, but the story goes way back. And like you say, and like Gilman says, it goes back really to this moment of uh, emancipation and the idea that the, I mean Gilman's idea is that in order to really be able uh, to 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 belong and to call yourself a member of civil society, you have to learn and to know how to take a punchline. And right. if I can add something to that really quickly, because we don't actually have enough Kaplan's. Um, one of the things that I didn't mention in my remarks, but I appreciated about that particular conversation, is that Mordecai Kaplan. Um, yeah, more Kaplan, has, uh, has something that he says in Judaism as a Civilization, that if the Jews had achieved full emancipation, that the Jewish people would have disappeared. Um, and I think that what Gilman's saying and, and what you're saying um, is an important counterpoint to the idea that emancipation would have necessarily ushered in a complete erasure or e evaporation of the Jewish people. So I, I thought that was a really important point. So Jenny, I was wondering, actually, as I was listening to Lewis uh, answering Steve's questions about, uh, you know, what things that, um, uh, I don't know, alerted your attention as a specialist in American humor and American Judaism in his book, like things that uh, uh, seemed irrelevant or not understood by, uh, could be not understood by American Jews that were hilarious to uh, German Jews of Weimar Republic. And, you know, uh, as you think of answering that, uh, of what to say, I want to say that there's something about studies of humor that make it unbelievably acute. Like I'm looking at our questions uh, that are coming in and so many of them are doing, uh, are dealing with specific contemporary right now issues. There are three questions, for example, what you all think about Borat, uh, you know, right now, right? And it is very interesting. And there is also a joke in the questions that I will read to you later that wants, uh, you know, scholarly interpretation, what that means. So there is no other area of studies, I think, that allows us to get right into the heart and soul of anything that we study than humor, because, uh, uh, you know, there is something extremely, unbelievably contemporary and relevant to us. And the second that relevance disappears, then we're studying historical humor, which is unbelievably hard because the nuance is uh, missing. So uh, I was hoping that Jenny would address that a little bit. And then if you want, well, you're here all the way from Baltimore. So, <laughs> and then we will get into our Q uh, questions that are coming in. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a lot there and I'll, I'll sort of try to pull in some of what I've been seeing in the Q&A as well. Um, part of what draws me to this book and this study is that something that I've argued for, um, that I argue for in my book and that, that I've argued for in other places, is that a real understanding of humor requires a really deep dive into understanding a place, understanding a time. It, it's not just it's not just language, it's not just that jokes don't translate well, it's that you have to understand the zeitgeist of a moment to really understand what's going on with the humor. Um, and I think that Lewis does such a good job of, of doing that with this book. And actually, I had a different reaction to the afterward than, than Steve did. I actually didn't care as much for the afterward. Or it's not that I didn't care for it, it's that 
the fact that we don't have that depth of conversation about these very contemporary things really highlights how good the depth of conversation is in the in the preceding book. Um, and that's part of my answer to Borat as well. I, I actually, I don't teach Borat in my Jewish humor class because my Jewish humor class is American Jewish humor. And I think you can't understand Sasha Baron Cohen's humor fully without going through how the history of English Jewry and, and British Jewry is different than American. It's, it's not the same. And, and all the questions that were coming up at the beginning about insiders and outsiders and my, minorities and majorities, and I think all of that's incredibly relevant. And the, the story of Jews in Great Britain isn't the same as the story of Jews in the United States, and you really have to get that full context. Um, so, you know, that's to kind of dodge the Borat question to a certain extent, but I, I don't talk about Sasha Baron Cohen in the context of American humor, even though what he's doing is focused on America as a target. He, as a Jewish person and as a comedian, isn't coming from an American sensibility. Um, and I just, I think that's an important point. Really, really important point. And I do want to say that just like as acuteness goes with humor, it's also violence. You know, try to talk about Jewish humor without saying the word anti-Semitism, which is, I think, the most popular word in the chat, in a, not in the chat, in Q&A right now, like the difference between Jewish joke and anti-Semitic joke. Um, okay, so I want to read to you, uh, you plural, I think I, I think Louis should probably t uh, answer that first, but if others have something to contribute, uh, please do too, by, from our colleague uh, uh, Gabby Fender from University of Virginia. Uh, so I'm just going to read it. Uh, hello, Louis. Uh, I look forward to reading your book. My question is this. In 1960, Salka Landman wrote a best-selling book, Der Jüdischer Witz. She wrote that a Jewish joke belongs to the Jewish past in Germany after the Holocaust. Do you agree? Is there a place of Jewish humor in Germany after the Holocaust? Moreover, Lanzmann's book has gone through many editions and one can find it in German and Austrian bookstores today. What might account for the enduring popularity of Lanzmann's book, which itself contains Jewish jokes? <laughs> Well, I've written a 35-page chapter on this topic, so I don't really know how to answer it in, in one paragraph. You should but, answer it by saying, buy my book. Yeah, please, right? <laughs> but no, I mean, the, the Lantman uh, book uh, and the controversy around it with Friedrich Torborg is very important uh, in the context of Wieder Guttmachung. Uh, I mean, I talk about it in terms of that cultural moment. Uh, I talk about it uh, in terms of how and why it became this bestseller. And um, I talk about it in the context of this neologism that I invent there, which I call joke mourning and joke reparations. And again, that's, it's a very loaded uh, idea and it's double barreled. Uh, and it raises these, these provocative questions that I think the book did raise of whether, is it making a joke out of mourning uh, that somehow you don't have to get to the Tawa Arbeit, as Freud would call it, you know, the serious work of mourning so that you can just laugh it off in a book? Or was it somehow a, a way of being a kind of valid monumentalizing of this Jewish cultural achievement uh, so f for that you could actually uh, say this is a, an honorable and respectful way uh, in order to honor uh, the victims of the Holocaust. It's a very difficult a question, an issue, and um, it's so multi-sided and, and ambivalent. And um, I think the, my book uh, really plays out um, uh, that in that chapter on Sociolatwin. I, I actually also corresponded with her. I mean, that's another thing. Of all the people, you know, that I write on, on in this book, I mean, most of them were dead uh, at the time I got to it. But she lived till 2002, as you know, Gabi. And um, I was, you know, I actually uh, also include some amazing uh, comments that she had in this correspondence that we had while, when I was a Rosenzweig fellow. Um, so I, I think you'll, you'll enjoy uh, uh, reading that. Now with the question in relationship to 
um, where is uh, Jewish humor in Germany today? I mean, sure. I mean, there there are uh, uh, there are people that that are carrying it on, right? We have in film. We have right the the famous film Zucker, right? That was that that was a big hit. We have uh, uh, what's his I forgot his first name, but the, the comedian uh, uh, Polak Polak, right? Is another one. I forgot his first name. Um, but no, I mean there are obviously it's a change situation, but we, we is it probably is probably coming in from somebody. Right. Uh, but, you know, we have a, a, a situation where, um, you know, I think that, yeah, I mean, even today, right, the, 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 there, is, there is a place for with the, the new Jews uh, living there. And also, funnily enough, um, the, the paper that I gave at the conference uh, where, where that Jenny hosted was also in a way a kind of not Jewish German, but Israeli German humor with this artist. Uh, Erez uh, Israeli, uh, who uh, is doing this very provocative work, um, both from the subject position of an Israeli Jew living in Berlin and also as a homosexual artist. And, you know, so in a way being kind of doubly, you know, uh, uh, out, uh, excluded if, if he were in uh, the, the Nazi times, so, right? Uh, uh, and really raising some, twice minorized, you might say, right? And really raising some very interesting uh, questions about about Holocaust humor. Uh, so yeah, so and, and hopefully that work will will, will be seeing publication uh, soon in, in, in the uh, volume that uh, Jenny and uh, Jared are editing. So there are a lot of questions on uh, that, but I want to make sure our panelists so uh, don't want to add anything. Uh, I, I just uh, this is actually goes to uh, Lewis uh, and it's partly an answer because it involves both Lundmann and Torborg, yeah. it involves Wiener and Rubicek, and it involves Borat, because there are those who see Borat as kind of a, the, the worst of these Jewish comics, who is spoiling the Jewish name, who is proving the, the negative Jewish stereotype, mm -hmm. but he's also a master satirist. And there is a chapter in the book where Lewis brilliantly discusses the question of what is free speech and when does free speech violate any sense of danger and of decency when he talks about the satirist Robicek and the uh, Zentralvereins Wiener, of whom later the Wiener Library became part of that. So, um, what is very interesting with Lewis, in each of those cases, except one, Lewis is moderate and is even-handed. Mm. So when it comes to Rubicek and Wiener, he's for free speech, but he completely understands Wiener. Um, when it comes to Borat, I, he, I think he would take a similar position, one has to ask him. But I must say this, Lewis, in the torborg landman mm. debate, it mm. seemed to me that you clearly were siding with Torberg mm. and that you have a very dense critical notion about Lantman, yeah. almost accusing her of, I think, well, I'll, I'll leave it at that. It, but there, it's the first time I noticed more than a even-handed criticism and something like a prosecutorial tone that may be too harsh wow that's quite the we can't have that <laughs> no. uh so okay so i think between the three of you you kind of answered some of the questions but i want to read them anyway uh so the, and then answers ask some that they were not yet answered so um a person named jerry weiss uh from cleveland is asking can you address a German Jewish humor that denigrates East European Jews. So I want you to like uh, keep those questions, the list, and then uh, later answer them as I. Uh, oh, are you showing me? I, I, no, I'm pointing to Steve because. Okay, but the, for book. me, he's the other way. Okay, so, so for me, he's that way. But because we all know his his classic on the subject of uh, brothers and strangers in terms of the relations of German Jews and East German uh, East European Jews. Uh, and, and their, their, their images uh, uh, and, re and reflections and relations with each other. So, you know, I, I want to defer to him on that one first. I don't know if he's okay with that. 
Right. Well, very, very quickly, because if your study is Jurassic, mine is pre-Jurassic. It was, it was published in 1982. So I have only a vague memory of what is in there. But I'll try and relate it to, to something that is in your book. And that is to say, uh, I mean, everybody knows about this tension between German Jews and East European Jews. I'm taking that as, as a given. Um, but what is very interesting is very, and you give some examples in your book. Let's not talk about my book, but yours. All right. We demonstrate that some German Jews deflected negative stereotypes of the Jew onto the East European Jew. So there would be a dif distinction between a Bildungsjude, an educated, cultivated Jew, and the Schnorrer-like ghetto, ghetto, ugly, whatever Jew of the East. Now, what's interesting for me is just one thing, and that is to say, my book was, was, did not appear in German, it was supposed to appear with Fischer Verlag. In the end, they decided not to do it in 1982. Why? The reason they gave me is that this would add to anti-Semitic stereotypes because you can't publish a book in post-Holocaust Germany where Jews are making fun of or critiquing other Jews. And the irony is that if you go to anti-Semitic sites, and I'm sure all of you are constantly studying anti-Semitic sites, you will find my book there as evidence that Jews say the same thing about other Jews as anti-Semites do. Can I interject there, Steve, um, just to add to what you're saying? I mean, Freud is another example of this, right? I mean, a lot of the jokes that are in the, you know, I know you wanted me to talk a little bit more about the Witzbuch, right, from Freud. Um, a number of those jokes are, uh, you know, Western uh, Jews uh, making fun and disparaging uh, the stereotypes, uh, playing on the negative uh, comic stereotypes of their Eastern brothers, uh, becoming strangers, uh, like, you know, about hygiene, right? There's the joke, um, have you taken a bath? What is there one missing, right? I mean, you know, <laughs> silly, silly jokes like that, uh, kind of, but, but, you know, I think in that regard, Freud as a Bildungsjude was also buying into that uh, uh, relationship of, of inferiority and superiority um, and uh, the kind of, you know, the ordeal of civility, which the Western uh, German Jew had passed through, but that the Eastern Jew had not and was struggling with. Yeah. So um, we have, oh, Jenny, did you want to say something? Well, no, I, I was just gonna sort of tack on to that. Um, what I was mentioning before about uh, Freud and, and his idea that you have to have equal investment um, on, on both sides of the joke and to kind of go from that to my dad's question in the chat. Hi dad. Um, <laughs> about the relationship. Yeah, I know we've all got our dads here. Today. Um, and my mom. Uh, relationship between the hearer of the joke and the teller of the joke. And uh, this idea about superiority, um, humor breeding superiority, that goes all the way back to Thomas Hobbes. Um, it's one of the oldest theories of humor and one thing that we sort of know psychologically is that people will laugh at jokes they don't get because they think that to admit that they don't get it is to exclude themselves from some sort of inner dialogue in, inner circle that's happening that, that you become an outsider if you don't get the joke and so people laugh at things that they don't actually understand because they're afraid of of losing that superiority of, of losing their status within the group um and and so i think that when when freud and freud loves the jokes about the galician jews right all of the jokes about the eastern jews um and, and i think that that's part of what he's nodding to is the psychological side of needing to make yourself a part of whatever the the higher group on the pole is you know whatever one rung up the ladder um wherever you can get yourself up is really important psychologically for Freud and, and for the way that he sees humor. Mm -hmm. So, um, okay, so what I'm going to do now, just you have to listen to me for one second, I'm going to read like five questions to you, okay, because I want to give our audience a chance to have a voice, and then, Louis, you choose which ones you want to 
answer and other panelists as well. Yes. Are these grad, are these grad student questions or open from the general floor now? Yes, so no? far, these are general public questions. Okay. Uh, so I'm reading them myself. Uh, for now. So there is okay, questions on Borat we can't that we answer. Uh, there are a lot of questions. Somebody from Alfred in Toronto uh, is asking about uh, Israeli humor versus, uh, versus um, uh, Jewish humor. Israeli audiences respond or uh, in fact don't respond to my humor the way North American audiences do. Is there such thing as Jewish humor? and Israeli humor. And then there is a similar question by Morai Teitel, which says, I know it is a value judgment to answer, but is there a correlation between quality of jokes and level of oppression uh, of being an outsider? Uh, if that is true, should Israeli Arab comedians be funnier than Israeli Jews? Um, and then there is a very specific question uh, to Lewis about, uh, uh, from a person uh, who probably read your book already, Lewis, uh, Jan Kuna, who is asking about uh, Sammy Groneman, known as Sholom Aleichem of German Jews, as well as nicknamed uh, Aristophanes of the Zionist movement. Uh, had had a decisive influence onto the Jewish literary scene of the Weimar Republic in the 1920s with his satiric uh, bestseller, oh, I'm going to butcher it, Tohu uh, Wawohu. Why is this important author missing from the book? And then there's a PS to the same question. The book would be pertinent to your discussion also because it's one of the rare examples of a novel that developed out of a joke into a book which claims one of the most original opening sentences in world literature. And while you're at it, there are questions on like what qualifies jokes as Jewish and stuff like that. So, you know, think about this. So I'm going to stop reading for now. There are a lot more questions, but this should give you enough to, uh, to respond. Okay, well, I can start with uh, Sami Groneman. I mean, obviously, I am familiar with his work to some extent. I know uh, uh, Jan Kuna has, has worked on him. Um, also, when I was at the Rosenzweig Center years ago, uh, a shout out to uh, Hani Mittelmann, who uh, also published a book on uh, Groneman. So it's uh, not as if he was not, uh, wasn't on my radar. Um, but, you know, I, I kind of felt I was, con I really was looking for authors uh, who were dealing with the discourse of the Jewish joke that somehow, as it's come out already, had, were really somehow involved with this dialectic between Jewish self-irony and then its appropriation into uh, anti-Semitic discourse. And I don't, I'm not really sure that for me, Groneman really struck that kind of chord as some of the other figures that are in my book. Um, however, I should also say there are people that, you know, and also for the same reason, there are other figures that I wanted to deal with that didn't make the final cut. And another one who's interesting in that respect uh, also uh, is someone who uh, uh, emigrated uh, to Israel, uh, and that's Ernst Simon, right, the philosopher of education, who also published a very interesting essay. And that's the other thing, too. I remember that a number of my figures, except for um, Robichek. I mean, Robichek is an exception in a way because, because he's a comedian, right? And a performer, right? But most of the people that are in my book are actually not in the performing arts of telling Jewish jokes, right? They're more historians and propagandists, of course, uh, particularly on the Nazi side, uh, right? So that's another reason, you know, why um, I would say the more practitioners don't are not are, I'm a bit le I'm somewhat less interested in them. But the, another person who didn't make the cut to get back to the kind of Zionist connection um, is Ernst Simon, right? Who was a philosopher of education and who wrote a very interesting uh, text on the psychology of the the problem of the of the Jewish joke in terms of psychology and also tying it back into questions of the Hebrew language and also in relationship to uh, um, the the Bible. Uh, and uh, also in terms of uh, the question of, uh, of uh, re religion, relationship of, of uh, Jewish joke uh, to, uh, to spirituality. Um, these are all very, very interesting uh, issues. Uh, but again, because I didn't feel there was the dynamism in that particular study of this dialectic between Jewish self-irony and uh, anti-Semitic uh, reappropriation, um, he didn't make the final cut. But you know, there's always a chance for a volume two. 
<laughs> and we're hoping for that. Um, can I say a few words about just Israeli humor that, um, first that one, the reason I asked Lewis the question, which he brilliantly evaded as if I had not answered, uh, can there be irony amongst a majority? Okay. So first of all, in the sense of classical Jewish irony, the Zionist dream is that there should be a Jewish majority. So the minoritarian uh, element is gone. Um, right. That doesn't mean to say there isn't satire in Israel, and there certainly is. There was a wonderful group, the Hamisha uh, Kamarit, uh, who were brilliantly satirical. I haven't seen much of it lately, but I just want to mention one thing. It was a wonderful question whether the Israeli Arab would have that. And it's a great pity for me that Said Kachua is at the University in Champaign, uh, Urbana, rather than in Israel, because that's exactly what he used to do week by week. Hmm. Although, you know, Steve, when he came to Toronto to give a talk, Said Kachua, it was very successful. A lot of people came, but our students could un couldn't understand the humor, couldn't understand hmm. the single joke. We showed Arab labor and that uh, it was not funny. It was interesting, but it was not funny because, you know what I mean, like it, it, they didn't understand what it was about. Um, I, I think maybe we're being too, um, we're overgeneralizing about what constitutes majority and what constitutes minority. And at the risk of sounding like a relatively young feminist, um, we, have to, we have to think more intersectionally about people's identities. So you look at a group like, um, the Jews are coming, uh, contemporary Israeli satire. And I think they would see themselves as a minority and they would see themselves as outsiders in being relatively secular and in being pushing against some sort of hegemonic, the man, you know, religious version of the man. So it, I, I think within any, any given context, someone might be a majority in one way, but still have that outsider mentality that lends itself to irony and satire. I, I absolutely accept that. I, I should have thought of that. And it just reminded me of my brother-in-law who said to me, Stephen, as an outsider, what do you think of the human race? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's a good transition to what I wanted to do next. So we managed to go like an hour and 18 minutes and not a single joke. Our people, our audience has an issue with that. So there are, they're helping us. They're telling jokes. So there are two jokes in the chat. So I'm going to read them to you because, uh -huh. you know, uh, what kind of talk will it be without that? And uh, you tell me, you tell us what you think about this. So yeah. another a joke from Murray title. Uh, Azeda is in upstairs in his bedroom near death. His wife sends their grandson up to check on him. He smells the fragments of the rugelach. His wife was baking downstairs and it's his favorite pastry and he asked the grandson to bring, bring him some. And the kid comes back with, a, with no rugelach and says, and the grandpa says, what happened to rugelach? And the grandson says, booby, uh, they said it's for later. Okay, that's joke one. And then there is a joke, uh, just a second, I'm going to scroll down from David Weinfeld, uh, who says the following thing. Hi, David, by the way. Um, a student tells me the joke, which I think works well in the German context. Three Jews who just converted to Christianity meet in a bar and discuss their experience. The first one says, I converted because the job I wanted will only hire Christians. The second says, I converted because the woman I loved would only marry a Christian. The third one says, I converted because I believe that the truths and the principles of Christianity are superior to those in Judaism. The other two men replied, what do you take us for a couple of goyim? Mm -hmm. All right. So, um, I can yeah. comment on that. Be scholars, be scholars. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for that. Uh, particularly for the for that second joke. Uh, uh, who who was giving us that joke? I don't see. Uh, David Weinfeld. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, David. Yeah. I mean, I go through a number of jokes that are similar in their in their convoluted structure, uh, in terms of uh, uh, the the, the Trebitz chapter, right? Particularly because let's remember that uh, Arthur Trebitz, right, is this. Uh, self-hating, 
uh, Jewish anti-Semite who is fascinated with Jewish jokes and um, has this very problematic uh, relationship where, you know, these things keep flipping uh, in terms of him trying to think about himself as an outsider uh, but, uh, and a, as an Aryan, but then never being able to lose the, the traces of his Jewish connections, right? And, you know, there's a joke here that I tell on page 35 of my book, um, and uh, so I can, uh, I can start and uh, read a little bit to you. It's in this chapter entitled The Apostates from a classic collection of Jewish jokes, Alexander Moshkovsky, who Jenny referred to earlier, includes a variant of a popular baptism joke, a Taufenwitz of those assimilatory times. The sophisticated and transformative logic of this witty exchange points to an authentically inauthentic, there's the twists, Jewish experience and locates an aspect of Jewish identity in its very antithesis. It's very similar to the joke you told. Quote, have you already heard? David Bromson wants to get baptized. And then the answer, that's a really Jewish thing to do, right? And then the, the term in, in uh, German and Yiddish is, you know, echt Jüdisch, right? Echt Jüdisch uh, thing, thing to do. So it's exactly that, that, that kind of, uh, but I think the larger question here also is this, you know, when we talk about self-irony, you know, self-irony in a lot of, in some respects is actually um, a, a critique of identity, right? Because it makes a self-same identity unstable. And I think so much of Jewish humor does that. So that's my commentary on, on, on your excellent joke. Anyone else? What about Rugelach? No? Um, well, the Rugelach the Rugel, the Rugel is definitely a deadly discourse joke, right? Because, you know, you, right, you, can't, you can't eat the Rugelach until the guy is already uh, in the grave. So, yeah, and if you go back to Freud, he would say that that's tapping into our death drive. Although it's also strangely hopeful because life will go on, you know what I mean? Like, uh, it's, it's all part of it. Uh, you know, Not for grandpa, but you know. Exactly, exactly. Um, okay, um, so we have, uh, we have some more questions. There is uh, one from uh, me. Oh, sorry, uh, Steve, did you want to answer? Oh, no, I'm fine. You're good, okay. Um, right, right, somebody, somebody tied in, right, and said in the joke about the Rogolov, right, there's, a, there's an epigraph, there's another version, right? Another punchline is, Bubi said that the Rogolov are for the Shiva, right? They're not for you, they have to be saved for the, for the Shiva, so. Yeah, that's, but that's, that's, that's hitting you over the head with the punchline. The original there for later is a, I think is a funnier way to do the punchline. Right, it's more subtle, more subtle. Yeah. Okay, sorry to interrupt, go ahead. No, no, it's okay. Um, all right, so um, there is a, a question from Miki Friedman, Holland, with a large Jewish population before World War II, had a rich culture with Jewish jokes and Jewish jokes tell tellers. A lot of jokes had Sam and Moshe as the characters, and often one of the two was always self-effacing. The characters also were changed into Goyesha characters, and the culture is not very prevalent anymore. I am wondering if you have studied the Dutch Jewish jokes and described in your book. Unfortunately not. I, I have to take a pass on- For volume two, for volume my, two. Well, no, I don't know. I have, to, I have to brush up on my Dutch, don't I? No, I mean. <laughs> Um, there not, is, not my language, but uh, thank you for, for that, for knowing about that in terms of our uh, global Jewish humor tour that we're doing here. Right. Well, our uh, humor is global and our also is our audience. And the questions uh, actually uh, reflect that. Oh, and Laura Levitt, who is sadly leaving, but uh, did ask a question which we haven't addressed. And that is, are neo-Nazis the new Jews indeed? Yeah. I think this was in the earlier context. So maybe quickly answer uh, that if you have... Uh, um, yeah, well, that, that's, that, that's a great question, Laura. Sorry you're not here for the answer, but I mean, that's really a mind-bending, twisting uh, dre, right? I mean, the real spin, but where we are right now. And I mean, I take this up, you know, this is the last, I mean, I, I obviously I could write more about it, but it's the last thing that I talk about um, in this uh, postscript that I wrote, you know, about ironic Nazism and other anti-Semitic antics. I mean, that's what it's about. And it's really frightening, right? Because you have, you know, a, a neo-Nazi leader, you know, a white supremacist leader, let's, let's call him that, like Richard Spencer, you know, and he, he's speaking uh, in Washington a few weeks uh, after Trump's election. And, uh, 
everybody is giving the, the Hitler gruce, you know, or, or now called the Trump gruce, right? Uh, uh, when he says, hail Trump. And then people are like, what's going on here? You know, th this, is, this is Nazism uh, come to the United States. And then his defense is, this was clearly done in a spirit of irony and exuberance. And that's really, you know, frightening stuff, right? Um, and you see a lot of this, particularly, you know, in internet and web culture, and Gav Rosenfeld, of course, has written a lot about this in, in his High Hitler book, right? Uh, uh, which, which I think is very relevant to these types of issues, right? Of, of this, uh, uh, you know, this attempt to, obviously, to avoid the charge of hate speech, right? We have neo-Nazis casting everything they do in an ironic sense so that they always have this defense. Oh, it was just a joke, right? And that's why, you know, to get back to the, to the one, one of the earlier things that Steve said, you know, what Steve did in terms of the quote that he read, which is how my book ends, right? In this very uh, ironic, I mean, I'm being, obviously, I'm being very self-ironic uh, uh, and, uh, and mordant, uh, at the very end of the book, is I'm taking this quote from, that began my book from Edmund Edel um, from 1909 uh, in his book called The Wit of the Jews, and I'm substituting, and of course I'm also making a play on the idea of uh, the fact that the neo-Nazis are now replacing the Jews, right? Of course, riffing off of the Jews will not replace us, right? But actually, in this quote, you can this is a way of, of thinking about it. And it's, and it's a provocation, obviously, right? The neo-Nazi, I mean, instead of saying the Jew, you're saying the neo-Nazi not only loves to make fun of others, but also does not shy away from ironizing his own personality at every opportunity. Unfortunately, that's kind of where we are right now. Um, and um, it's a provocative statement, but, but it's definitely, uh, you know, the, the, the idea again, that when we talk about humor, uh, and laughter, we're also taking on uh, a lot of times some things that are the most serious uh, questions uh, that can only be addressed uh, through uh, this uh, ironic uh, sensibility. Right, but we did get to tell a few jokes, so we're like, we rock with that, uh, uh, <laughs> with combining scholarship and, uh, and uh, academic inquiries. Like, honestly, we have so few, uh, little time left, but I, I feel bad for not at least articulating those questions in the chat. For example, there's a really interesting question here from Victor Levin, does the humor of Kafka qualified uh, as a Jewish humor? I think uh, we already uh, addressed the question of Saul Kaplan, jokes are Jewish and otherwise a partnership between creator telling the listener what does the listener uh, have to bring to the table to make a joke uh, uh, really land uh, there is also a question which is not quite fair to panelists but uh, you know and the uh, James Man uh, Levinson who asked that acknowledges that but wants to know about Canadian context if there's such a thing as Canadian Jewish humor uh, you know and uh, yes uh, Oh, see, we got an answer. And I guess the last question I'll read in this uh, context is from Andres uh, Zervigna, uh, Zervigan that says, sorry if I'm mispronouncing uh, names, um, Louis, can you combine your areas of expertise and talk about uh, what may be photographic expressions of Jewish humor, particularly in the context of Germany? So what I suggest we all do is that uh, each of the panelists uh, say, uh, you know, address some of that, and then this will be the last uh, uh, time you speak in this context, and then uh, uh, and then we'll wrap up the event. Um, just let me say, as a geriatric uh, participant in this lovely symposium, it is now eleven thirty for me, uh, <laughs> so I I haven't got a final comment except you are getting it now. Good yes. night, and Lewis wonderful book i'm glad it's out and it's time to start thinking about your next cultural history book and so thank you very much and i'm leaving now oh Good night. okay thank you professor ashan thank, thank you for you. joining us so late and uh, for your contribution really thank you. Bye. And I'll say i'll say something briefly so that lewis can have the last word um i would say yes kafka is absolutely jewish humor um which is part of what I was alluding to earlier, that Lewis's project giving us a much more capacious definition of Jewish humor, I think is, is really helpful um, in that Jewish humor is not just one type, one ironic mode, one particular satiric thing. Um, 
And secondly, yes, there is absolutely a unique Canadian Jewish humor um, that not, I don't think all Canadian Jewish humorists are tapped, like Seth Rogen, for example, I, I think is more American Jewish humor than Canadian Jewish humor, but I think that there, there is a, a specifically Canadian Jewish humor tradition as well. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, especially there is the questions coming from about Yid life crisis, which we totally take as Canadian. Oh We've got a lot of a lot of diverse <laughs> jokes on the table. I mean, questions about jokes on the table right now. Mm -hmm. um, I concur uh, with the Kafka question. Uh, I mean, certainly uh, he's an important uh, humorist uh, who uh, definitely uh, links up with many themes. Um, he enters into my book in a couple of different places, um, most particularly in the chapter on Eric Collar, um, uh, who uh, was, you know, interested and fascinated by what we call the joke of exile, right? Uh, these were these jokes uh, around uh, uh, the time when the Jews were forced out of Germany and becoming refugees and where you're going to go. Uh, and, you know, the one, one of them, of course, is have you, you know, have you got another globe? I'll just tell you the punchlines, you know, you know, and then the other one is, uh, uh, too far away, far from where? Okay, so the, you could fill in the, the jokes, but those are the punchlines. Um, and, you know, there's this Kafka uh, story, short story, one of his parables, that's called Away From Here, right? I don't know if the, if, the, if the questioner is familiar with it. And it has exactly the same structure, you know, the, out that Jewish refugee joke, yet it was written uh, before the Jews were forced to leave uh, uh, Germany and Austria after, uh, after the Anschluss. So I think that's really interesting. Um, Andres, a uh, dear colleague uh, in photo studies, uh, who's in Berlin right now, thank you for signing in and, and with that marvelous question. Um, interestingly, you know, I mean, he knows my work, obviously, on photography and humor. And, um, you know, there are a number of figures um, in the history of photography who are very, very big on uh, Jewish humor. Um, but interestingly enough, um, I don't know if I would rank a German Jewish photographer in the top five. Um, I would certainly put Ouija, right, who, of course, our, our colleague Eddie Portnoy has also uh, worked on, uh, you know, as the, uh, 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 a photographer who is part of the uh, emigration uh, from Galicia uh, to uh, uh, the United States and who really has a very dark uh, black sense of humor uh, in his work. So he, you know, I, and, and I think there has been, you know, as I say, with, with Eddie's and, and others, have talked more about his work in the context of a, of a Jewish uh, uh, fr frame from the Lower East Side, right? Uh, uh, not, and, and his father was a rabbi, so I don't know if that makes him qualify as the, uh, as a, the, the bad son of a rabbi. Maybe that's a, another way to riff off of what he was in his life, who became a, 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 a kind of grungy photographer. Uh, and, but, but William Klein, I think, is also someone uh, in the context of the history of photography uh, who was an American expatriate who ended up in Paris and is still alive now in his 90s, who I think hasn't gotten enough attention as a kind of photographic humorist whose work is very much related to the kind of Jewish ghetto experience. So I think I'll, I'll, I'll uh, answer that question that way. Is your last word, Louis? And now what? This is your last word? Oh, my last word? Well, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what to say about Yid Life Crisis. I mean, Anna, you invited them also for a marvelous event. <laughs> Support of Jewish humor. The, the, right. Another marvelous live event that we had in our pre-COVID days back, back in the, before the plague. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I don't know. If, are any thoughts? I, I mean, I, I guess one question to tie it in with James's question is, might we consider them somehow from Coke St. Luke doing a kind of Canadian Jewish Montreal uh, style humor in their I think work? There are some local aspects to it, but uh, I think it's, it's uh, they find the audience both in Canada and in the United States. Uh, you know, translating into other regions, that would be interesting, whether German Jews or German audiences, uh, what, what exactly they would find funny about this. It's always interesting to think about that. But uh, uh, I do want to say that uh, the time is flying by when we're having a good time, and uh, we have to wrap up. And uh, I want to thank Louis uh, for, um, you know, 
for writing the book, for committing time to scholarship. It, it takes years of uh, solitary uh, work uh, with no immediate rewards to accomplish something like this. And uh, congratulations, it looks beautiful, it is interesting, and it is an honor to have you as a colleague and to learn from you and to uh, be beneficiary of your scholarship. Uh, thank you for organizing a book launch here.